but it's time to buzz the tower. In 1986, Top Gun redefined the Hollywood blockbuster, prompted a massive increase in U.S. Navy enlistment, helped turn Jerry Bruckheimer into a mega producer, and launched actor Tom Cruise into the A-list stratosphere. Considering the movie's pop culture impact and lasting legacy, it's hard to believe Top Gun had major difficulties getting off the ground. And find out what the fuck happened to this movie. Top Gun started life as a California Magazine article about a San Diego school for elite Navy fighter pilots. When producer Jerry Bruckheimer saw the piece and its thrilling images, he described it as Star Wars on Earth, and he set about acquiring the rights to make a movie based on the article. Right away, Bruckheimer and producing partner Don Simpson hit some turbulence. Aviation movies had gone out of style, and the 1984 Air Force TV series Call to Glory had just crashed and burned. The general perception in Hollywood at the time was that audiences just weren't very interested in watching planes and their pilots. Undeterred, the duo pitched the concept to Jeffrey Katzenberg at Paramount Pictures, and he was hesitantly receptive to the idea. Katzenberg recruited screenwriting team Jack Epps Jr. and Jim Cash, who had been toiling on Dick Tracy during its time in development hell, and gave them the challenge of turning the relatively brief Top Gun article into a feature-length film about hotshot military pilots. But Epps and Cash immediately realized that a movie just wouldn't even be possible unless they had access to actual F-14 Tomcat jets, and that would require the cooperation of the U.S. Navy. Before a single page of script was written, Simpson and Bruckheimer headed to the Pentagon to meet with high-ranking members of the Navy and pitch the broad strokes of their fictionalized version of Top Gun. Though the idea was initially met with skepticism, Secretary of the Navy John Lehman thought that a well-made movie about fighter pilots could be a victory for the military, and provisionally agreed to collaborate. Thanks for watching Joe Blow Videos. If you enjoy our shows, please like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Now, back to the show! Retired ace pilot Pete Viper Pettigrew was assigned as the movie's technical advisor and would act as liaison between the studio and the Navy. At this point, Epps and Cash had no idea what the movie's story would even be. Pettigrew's involvement was critical. His record and reputation opened doors and convinced otherwise reluctant pilots and instructors to share their stories. Jack Epps joined Pettigrew at the Real Top Gun Fighter School in Miramar, California, and performed numerous interviews with various personnel, gaining insight into not just military careers and tactics, but also personal lives and losses. Bits and pieces of these stories were effectively Frankensteined together into a script for Top Gun. But it was climbing into the backseat of a combat jet that was the creative epiphany for Epps, who was a private pilot himself, but had never been in a supersonic fighter plane. The exhilarating but exhausting experience of pulling G's and blasting through the sky at a thousand miles an hour made the writer realize these pilots were really athletes competing at the highest level. He and Cash decided to frame Top Gun like a sports movie, complete with locker room rivalries and a championship prize. After weeks of writing and consulting with Pettigrew, Epps and Cash turned in their first draft of Top Gun. Don Simpson flipped out for it, calling it one of the best screenplays he had ever read. But Pettigrew had some bad news. The Navy was never going to approve it, and major changes would be necessary. The Navy wasn't the only obstacle on the runway. Paramount executives, including then-President Michael Eisner, weren't exactly fans of the script. Even after several rewrites, and Simpson supposedly getting on his knees and begging Eisner to make the movie, the project ultimately stalled. But as Top Gun sat in storage, Eisner departed Paramount to become chairman of Disney, and took Jeffrey Katzenberg with him. Incoming Paramount head Ned Tannen needed new material for the studio, and soon after hearing the pitch for Top Gun, he gave the producers approval to make the movie with a budget of $14 million. For the lead role of cocky pilot Pete Maverick Mitchell, the writers had only ever thought of Tom Cruise, after seeing the actor in all the right moves. Bruckheimer and Simpson also anticipated Cruise was the next big star, and by that point they could not envision anyone else in the part. The only problem was, the actor was not particularly interested. Cruz had just finished shooting Ridley Scott's ambitious fantasy, Legend. He had recently ended a relationship with Risky Business co-star Rebecca De Mornay, and he was busy traveling the country and wasn't keen on committing to any major new projects. But Bruckheimer knew that Cruz was an adrenaline junkie. Even back then, he felt the need for speed. The producer thought Cruz might be convinced to star in the movie if he could just get the actor into a fighter jet and arranged for him to fly with the Blue Angels in California. 
Sure enough, zipping through the skies and hitting 4G turns was exactly the kind of persuasion that Cruz needed. There was a catch, of course. Cruz's agent wanted $1 million for his participation, which at the time was a cool chunk of change for a young actor with a single big success to his name. The producers flinched at the price tag and called the casting director asking for alternatives. But when she honestly couldn't think of anyone better suited for the part, Cruz got his first of many substantial paychecks. To direct the movie, Simpson and Bruckheimer went to Tony Scott, brother of Ridley. Scott was considered an unusual choice, as his only other feature, the 1983 David Bowie horror thriller The Hunger, had not exactly been well received, although the producers appreciated its atmosphere. But it was Scott's stylish advertising work that had really caught their eye, particularly a Saab commercial featuring a car racing a fighter jet. The director initially envisioned Top Gun to be something darker, like Apocalypse Now on an aircraft carrier, but he soon saw the potential of a popcorn movie about the rock stars of the skies. When it came time for casting, Scott was inspired by a Bruce Weber photo book of male models for the look of the characters. The project unsurprisingly became a hot Hollywood property for young up-and-coming actors. Val Kilmer was initially not interested, but was convinced by Scott to play Iceman, the meticulous contrast to Cruz's impulsive Maverick. Revenge of the Nerds co-star Anthony Edwards landed the role of Maverick's lovable radar officer, Goose. Other flight suits would be filled by Barry Tubb, Whip Hubley, Rick Rosevich, and Tim Robbins, with naval authority figures played by Michael Ironside, James Tolkien, and Tom Skerritt. For the movie's love interest, Charlie Blackwood, many actresses were considered, including Linda Fiorentino, Ali Sheedy, and Meg Ryan, who would instead get the smaller role of Goose's charming wife. The part of Charlie went to theater actor Kelly McGillis, who had made an impression with her recent work in the Harrison Ford thriller Witness. Scott felt she had the emotional maturity to believably match wits with the charismatic but egotistical pilots of Top Gun. But while the casting process had been relatively painless, the production itself would be a constant dogfight between the filmmakers and the Navy, who were extremely protective of the real Top Gun program and how it would be presented to mass audiences. Early drafts of the script had Charlie as an enlisted officer, but the Navy rejected this forbidden fraternization. The character was then changed to a civilian contractor, who ended up being based on an actual civilian specialist the filmmakers had met at Miramar. Another point of contention was the fate of Goose, who was originally going to perish in a mid-air collision, one of several accidents the movie planned to include. But the Navy would approve only one flight mishap, and it had to be a single plane. This led to the scene of Maverick going into a flat spin after traveling through another plane's jet wash, and Goose fatally ejecting into the canopy, all of which was based on real aerodynamics and a true story Pettigrew had shared. Another moment of unreality that incensed the Navy was the briefing scene, from Charlie's seamed stockings to Wolfman's taboo cowboy hat to the meeting taking place in a wide-open hangar rather than a more practical lecture room. When the actual Top Gun instructors on set that day expressed their concerns to Pete Pettigrew, he shrugged and said, at this point, I'm just trying to stop them from turning it into a musical. There were some other concessions, like the locker room scene. Pettigrew understood the film's sports analogy and the idea of a place where conversations could happen outside of rank and uniform, and also the potential appeal of shirtless hunks to certain audience demographics. Similarly, there was initial resistance to the movie's fictional Top Gun trophy, which represented a physical goal for the competition at the Fighter Weapons School. As screenwriter Jack Epps put it, never let the truth get in the way of a good movie. As for buzzing the tower, this was absolutely prohibited under any circumstances. But one lucky Navy pilot got the opportunity to live out the fantasies of his Top Gun peers with a low-altitude flyby just for the movie. Before filming even started, Bruckheimer had sent the script to Axel F. composer Harold Faltermeyer, asking him for an anthem, which he put together without seeing a frame of footage. Scott would play Faltermeyer's theme song on the set to establish tone and pump up the cast. To prepare for the shoot, the actors went through a four-day pilot survival training course at Miramar. The production itself was broken into three stages, starting with all the dramatic scenes on the ground, filmed in and around San Diego. Cruz, who was feeling the pressure of headlining a major studio movie, took a method approach and stayed separate from the other actors, particularly his on-screen rival Val Kilmer, who often partied with his fellow film pilots. During this early phase, Tony Scott was constantly under threat of dismissal by the studio for his vision. From McGillis's wardrobe and glamorous makeup, to the excessive time spent filming the now iconic volleyball scene, which the director once jokingly called soft porn. Scott later commented that he basically got fired from the movie several times, but just kept filming anyway. 
McGillis herself was also nearly on the chopping block when studio executives saw dailies and weren't convinced of her chemistry with Cruz. Editor Billy Weber quickly assembled the dinner scene to help the producers assure the studio of her appeal, rather than recast and reshoot all her completed footage. From there, the production headed to the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise, which presented other difficulties. In addition to being an incredibly noisy environment for the director to communicate with his cast and crew, the carrier was engaged in actual operations at the time, and the production was essentially just along for the ride to capture whatever footage they could. At one point, Scott was shooting a critical scene at magic hour when the captain began turning the ship, losing the director's perfect natural lighting. Scott asked how much it would cost to change course and wrote a personal check for $25,000 to get the captain to turn around for a few minutes so Scott could get his shot. Val Kilmer also took some convincing over a line of dialogue that he felt was too hokey to say in front of actual Navy personnel on the deck of the carrier, but Scott eventually talked him into it. You can be my wingman anytime. Then the Navy wasn't entirely tolerant of the Hollywood flyboys. Rick Rosevich was actually escorted off the vessel before filming was complete after making wisecracks to officers. The final stage of production was capturing the intense aerial scenes. Various scale models were used for the crashes and explosions, but the biggest production challenge was shooting high-velocity flying footage in ways that had never been done before. Scott scrawled hand-drawn storyboards and worked with top Navy aerial coordinators to develop the flying scenes, which were shot in Nevada using real Navy pilots, and continually evolved based on the limitations of actual physics, often to Scott's frustration. Air footage was filmed with a camera-equipped Learjet and an F-14 mounted with external cameras, while lower altitude scenes were shot using a camera rig placed on a mountaintop as the jets blasted by at supersonic speed. Once the planned scenes were shot, Scott asked the pilots to perform any other maneuvers they thought might be visually impressive. This impromptu session led to the Pitch Pulse, an instantaneous 6G pull-up that wowed Scott so much it became Maverick's signature move. One thing that did not go to plan was capturing airborne footage of the actual actors in the rear of the cockpit, showing their faces and delivering dialogue. Kilmer had declined to go up in a jet, but of the actors that did take to the skies, everyone except Anthony Edwards ejected their lunch. Barry Tubb joked that he vomited so much his own toenails came up. Needless to say, all the in-air footage of the actors was unusable. Scott ended up filming all the cockpit scenes in a simulator gimbal on a soundstage, using real aerial footage playing on a screen behind the actors. As potentially dangerous as the real-life jet maneuvers might have been, it was capturing that projection footage that led to a tragic accident. Professional aerobatic pilot Art Scholl was filming background plates for the flat spin sequence when he experienced mechanical failure and was lost in a crash. The film was dedicated to him. Once principal photography wrapped in autumn 1985, Scott and editors Chris LeBenzon and Billy Weber started stitching together the movie. The screening of their first cut was a disaster. The flying sequences were incomprehensible, and the movie did not work without them. Harold Faltermeyer was so confounded he tried to get out of working on the film. Tony Scott was, yet again, in danger of getting fired. But Simpson and Bruckheimer remained optimistic. They sat down with Scott and the editors and reassembled the movie frame by frame. Scott's storyboard sketches and vision for the flying scenes had proven useless relative to the footage he had captured, and the sequences were effectively built from scratch in the editing room, using input from real Top Gun pilots. Shooting new aerial footage was unthinkable, and in the days before convincing CGI, the only option was to scour the existing film for any suitable moments. Editor Billy Weber said that out of several hundred thousand feet of flight and cockpit footage, every usable frame was in the final movie. Luckily, the actors' mouths were usually covered by oxygen masks, since new dialogue needed to be written and recorded to conform to the manufactured scenes. Simpson and Bruckheimer's previous box office blockbusters, Flashdance and Beverly Hills Cop, had multi-platinum selling soundtracks, and that expectation was the same for Top Gun. A cut of the movie was screened to a cattle call group of musicians and pop acts to solicit song contributions, resulting in more than a hundred submissions for the filmmakers to sort through and select their favorites. Kenny Loggins' song, Playing With The Boys, was used for the infamous volleyball scene, and he was also a last-minute replacement for the band Toto on Danger Zone, which ended up being one of Loggins' biggest hits. While the movie had been shaped into satisfactory form, Paramount still wanted feedback from an actual outside audience and selected Dallas for a screening. Just days before it was scheduled, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded after takeoff, killing the seven crew members aboard. As the nation mourned the tragedy, the screening went ahead as planned. 
dreading a subdued response from the moviegoers, the producers were instead pleasantly surprised by an overwhelmingly positive reaction, and they knew they had a hit on their hands. Exhibitor screenings followed, and the feedback was that the movie was exciting, but the romance needed to be stronger. The filmmakers quickly convened to add a couple more scenes. Unfortunately, McGillis's hair had been cut short and returned to her natural color, while Cruz was busy filming Martin Scorsese's The Color of Money with a new, higher hairstyle, and he was only available for one day. To circumvent these issues, they put McGillis in a hat and soaked down Cruz's hair for the elevator seduction, and then filmed a quick love scene in shadow. The additional PG-rated passion was swiftly edited into the movie just before the final mix was finished and theatrical prints were cut. In May 1986, Top Gun premiered in New York and San Diego, where the cast and crew were in attendance, along with Navy pilots and top brass, who were not nearly as impressed as the filmmakers and studio. Also vocal in their disappointment were the critics. Although the flying scenes earned praise, Top Gun received brutal reviews that called it clunky, predictable, corny, and jingoistic propaganda. But general audiences didn't care in the slightest. The movie opened in first place at the box office and rapidly became a cultural phenomenon. Sales of bomber jackets and aviator sunglasses skyrocketed. Navy recruitment soared, and thanks to the increased spotlight, the actual Top Gun school was rewarded with new planes and headquarters. Tunes from the soundtrack were omnipresent, and Berlin's ballad, Take My Breath Away, reached number one on the Billboard charts and won an Oscar for Best Original Song, while Goose and Maverick's awkward barroom rendition prompted a radio resurgence of the Righteous Brothers' You've Lost That Love and Feeling. The Top Gun soundtrack ultimately sold over 11 million copies. Top Gun remained in theaters for 10 months, eventually collecting $175 million domestic and over $350 million worldwide, and its home video release was one of the first VHS movies sold at an affordable retail price, eventually moving almost 3 million copies. The movie cemented Tom Cruise's status as an international superstar, and he is now forever associated with the brash character of Maverick. Several other cast members were also launched to stardom, Jerry Bruckheimer, along with Don Simpson until his death in 1996, produced a string of box office smashes and reunited with Tony Scott on five more productions. The director sadly took his own life in 2012. Top Gun's energetic style and unapologetic mix of music, militarism, and machismo influenced countless movies and filmmakers. And of course, it's also prompted some interesting discussions and interpretations. It is a story about a man's struggle with his own homosexuality. While the movie does remain distinctly 80s, after more than three and a half decades, its propulsive aerial sequences are still considered some of the most remarkable ever put on film. And while a sequel had been discussed ever since the first movie's success, Tom Cruise is finally climbing back into the cockpit and hitting the afterburners again for Top Gun Maverick, because audiences still feel that need. The need for speed. Long before James Cameron developed breakthrough filmmaking technologies, voyaged to the bottom of the sea, collected various award statues, and obliterated box office records to become the self-proclaimed king of the world, he was just another struggling director trying to get through his first Hollywood feature. The acclaimed 1984 sci-fi thriller The Terminator launched a franchise and boosted Arnold Schwarzenegger to stardom, but actually making the movie was almost tougher than traveling through time. Come with me if you want to live. And find out what the fuck happened to this movie. James Cameron was a gifted artist from an early age, and in his 20s was inspired by movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey and Star Wars to break into the film business. By the early 1980s, he was applying his artistic talents at B-movie producer Roger Corman's company, working on models, art, and effects for movies like Battle Beyond the Stars, Galaxy of Terror, and Escape from New York. Around this time, Cameron got his first opportunity to direct a feature film on the low-budget sequel Piranha 2 The Spawning taking over for the first director who was fired by the movie's Italian producer. But after just a few days of further disharmony on the set, Cameron met the same fate as his predecessor. The producer, who Cameron would later refer to as Fuckwit, took over shooting the film, including, perhaps not coincidentally, all the scenes of topless women. After buying his own ticket to Rome to see a rough cut of the very movie he had been dismissed from, Cameron was not especially pleased with the end result, which he later called the stupidest idea in the history of flying piranhas. He tried, unsuccessfully, to have his name removed from the picture, but learned it could not contractually be delivered with an Italian name as director. Much to his dismay, he was stuck with Piranha 2 on his filmography. 
But there was one benefit from the otherwise miserable experience. While in Italy, broke and alone, Cameron became ill from exhaustion and had a fever dream that gave him one particularly memorable image, a skeletal metallic figure emerging from a fire. That nightmarish vision became the foundation of what would evolve into the Terminator. Once back in Los Angeles, Cameron's idea expanded from a John Carpenter-inspired slasher with sci-fi elements into an elaborate story of a futuristic soldier sent back in time to protect a young woman whose unborn son would eventually play a critical role in saving mankind. The initial outline actually involved a pair of cyborg assassins, with a liquid metal machine dispatched to the past after hero Kyle Reese eliminates the first robotic hitman. Cameron thought he could use a chrome-covered claymation technique and other camera trickery he picked up from his low-cost Corman career to achieve the effects for the liquid villain, but he ultimately streamlined the story to a single standard cybernetic antagonist, at least until years later when the technology caught up with his imagination. After Cameron's agent ridiculed the sci-fi concept and was summarily fired for the dissenting opinion, Cameron found a supporter and collaborator and future wife and ex-wife in Gail Ann Hurd, who was also working for Roger Corman at the time. Hurd agreed to produce the film, and Cameron sold her the rights for one dollar, with the understanding no one else would be allowed to direct. That foresight would prove to be a blessing and a curse. The duo pitched The Terminator around Hollywood as a low-budget, guerrilla-style production, Studios were interested in the strong sci-fi script, but not the unproven director attached. After so many rejections, eventually they wound up at Orion Pictures, where another pair of Corman alumni, Barbara Boyle and Francis Dole, championed the project. Orion chief Mike Metavoy agreed to distribute the movie, but only if they could secure financing elsewhere. Early on, Cameron had already selected his Terminator. During his brief time on Piranha 2, he had befriended star Lance Henriksen, and asked him to play the title role, even using the actor's likeness for concept art. Cameron initially pictured his cyborg killer as lean and average-looking, yet secretly dangerous, as befitting an infiltration unit. When it came time to approach Hemdale Film Corporation for funding, Cameron sent Henriksen to the office dressed in a leather coat and boots, with metal teeth and makeup gashes on his face. After Henriksen kicked in the door and sat staring wordlessly for several minutes, Cameron entered and delivered his enthusiastic pitch to the company executive. The combination worked, and by late 1982, Cameron had six million bucks to make his vision a reality. Of course, as we all know, Henriksen would not get to play the Terminator. Mike Metavoy had become fascinated by bodybuilder-turned-actor Arnold Schwarzenegger and wanted him for the movie, but in the role of time-tossed soldier Kyle Reese, Metavoy thought the Terminator should be played by O.J. Simpson. Cameron could not picture Simpson as a stone-cold killer, at that time anyway, but he agreed to have lunch with Schwarzenegger out of courtesy, with every intention of sabotaging the meeting and claiming creative differences. As Cameron told his roommates before the meeting, I'm going to pick a fight with Conan. But instead, the pair hit it off, finding they had a surprising amount in common. Schwarzenegger, so early in his film career, was initially hesitant to take a villain role with a mere 17 lines of dialogue. But by the next day, he was committed to targeting Sarah Connor for termination. Cameron didn't need to change his script or storyboards, but his villain had suddenly gone from an ordinary, unassuming figure to a menacing murder machine. The filmmaker even thought Schwarzenegger's thick Austrian accent was beneficial, saying it had a strange synthesized quality. To play Kyle Reese, Cameron thought about the police frontman Sting for the role. And according to Cameron, the musician was interested but changed his mind when he learned of the director's association with Piranha 2. Christopher Reeve was briefly considered, but his $1 million asking price was well outside the boundaries of the small budget. The part ultimately went to Michael Bean, who had impressed the filmmaker with the intensity of his psychotic stalker from the 1981 thriller The Fan. Despite Bean's convincing audition for Reese, Cameron was concerned about his southern accent. It turned out the actor had spent that morning auditioning for a theater production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and had subconsciously retained his drawl. When he returned for a second reading, free of accent, the part was his. Among those who auditioned for the movie's reluctant young heroine, Sarah Connor, were Jennifer Jason Lee, Rosanna Arquette, and Leah Thompson. But Cameron and Heard settled on little-known TV actress Linda Hamilton, who they felt best captured both the character's vulnerability and strength. While it seems unfathomable now, Hamilton and Bean were skeptical about co-starring with a man known mostly for his Mr. Olympia record, but Schwarzenegger's commitment to weapon training and robotic movement convinced them of the movie's potential. Cameron had his cast in place, including a different role for Lance Henriksen, and he was prepping to film. 
Unfortunately, he also suddenly had a lot of unexpected free time when producer Dino De Laurentiis decided to tie up Schwarzenegger with a contractually obligated sequel to Conan the Barbarian. With very little money in his pockets and several months before his hulking star could trade his Atlantean sword for a plethora of firearms, Cameron circulated his Terminator script, hoping to land a writing assignment, and he unintentionally found himself with an embarrassment of riches. Producers David Geiler and Walter Hill hired him to write a sequel to Alien, the very same day he landed an opportunity to write Rambo First Blood Part 2. In a panic, Cameron called Geiler asking for advice, and the producer bluntly told him, drink a lot of fucking coffee and do them both. And over just a few short months, that's exactly what Cameron did, along with simultaneously rewriting The Terminator and creating additional concept art and storyboards. His script for Rambo would later be drastically rewritten by star Sylvester Stallone. And although he didn't have time to complete his draft of Aliens, the producers and studio were so thrilled with what he had done, they decided to wait until after the Terminator to let him finish the script and potentially direct the Alien sequel. But that's a what the fuck episode for another day. To achieve the Terminator's ambitious robot effects, Heard and Cameron, along with the investors, wanted legendary makeup artist Dick Smith. But Smith didn't think he could accomplish the effects, and instead suggested a friend named Stan Winston, who he said was good with robots. Cameron bonded with Winston from the beginning, forming a collaboration that would last 25 years until Winston's death in 2008. Cameron was determined not to have the skinless version of his lethal robot played by a man in a suit, and Winston's small team spent six months constructing the metallic endoskeleton puppets, including a torso that could be worn on the back of a crew member. The team also fabricated a full-size reproduction of Schwarzenegger's head for the bathroom mirror eyeball removal scene. Shooting on the Terminator began in early 1984, but even that didn't start smoothly. Linda Hamilton badly sprained her ankle just before filming, necessitating a complete change to the schedule so her action scenes could wait until later in the production. With her ankle wrapped, she was in agony for most of the movie, but there would also be plenty of other suffering to go around during the grueling shoot. To keep costs down, most of the movie would be filmed at night, making it a frantic race against the clock to capture footage before the sun rose every day. On many occasions, Cameron and the crew rushed through scenes because they didn't actually have permits to film. With the constraints of time and budget, Cameron searched for areas with mercury vapor lamps to utilize the city's existing lighting, a source of torment for cinematographer Adam Greenberg, who nonetheless reunited with Cameron for the far better funded and equipped Terminator 2. Besides the practical endoskeleton and makeup effects, Cameron employed everything in his economical Roger Corman toolbox to achieve his sci-fi thrills. Forced perspective, stop motion, high-speed cameras, compositing, front projection, rear projection, and miniatures both small and large, some of which provided challenges that were appropriately small and large. For example, in the post-apocalypse sequence, the explosive canister used to demolish a hunter-killer tank was actually only about two inches big and took dozens of attempts to get the tiny prop to land perfectly under the rolling treads. On the other end of the size spectrum, for the movie's climactic fuel truck explosion, Cameron had initially wanted to blow up a real vehicle on the street, but unfortunately he had already captured the footage of the chase and burning wreckage near the police armory in downtown LA, and a giant fireball in such close proximity to ammunition and fuel could be catastrophic. So a miniature version of the street and tanker were constructed in a Burbank parking lot. But when the first attempted detonation went wrong, the effects crew had only two days to build another entire truck model from scratch, just to blow it up all over again. In addition to the hectic night shoot and effects challenges, many of the cast and crew endured various other kinds of punishment. Cameron set Schwarzenegger's arm on fire for the alley scene, and put acid on his jacket and hairpiece to achieve the smoking effect. A Stan Winston crew member was controlling the endoskeleton puppet head by hand as Michael Bean continually whacked it with a prop pipe, leading to an injury that later prompted a Christmas card from Cameron saying, Merry Christmas, hope the feeling comes back to your fingers someday. When Sarah and Reese emerge from hiding after the police station attack, they step out into a lovely morning mist that is actually lingering clouds of harmful insecticide that had been sprayed in the Los Angeles area to combat a major bug problem. Linda Hamilton was pounded and prodded so much that by the time she got accidentally jabbed in the throat with the Terminator's thrusting metal arm, she started to wonder if Cameron was secretly rooting for the machines. Her opening scenes of the movie were shot near the end of filming, by which point she had so many scrapes and bruises that she had to spend hours getting them covered with makeup. 
Even after principal photography had wrapped and post-production began, Cameron and a skeleton crew had to make a mad dash for inserts and pickups and stolen shots, including Schwarzenegger busting into a vehicle in broad daylight before anyone in the suburban neighborhood could call the cops. The final scene of the movie, filmed on a remote desert road and composited with a matte painting of the ominous sky, nearly landed them in trouble with a highway patrolman looking for a permit, but Cameron and Hurd got off the hook by pretending they were making a UCLA student film. Composer Brad Fidel put together the entire unforgettable synthesizer score in his garage, adjusting as needed as Cameron scrambled to deliver new footage to him each day. Cameron had somehow found time during the shoot to assemble rough cut scenes to show his lead actors, and the more they saw, the more energized they became and believed all the pain would be worth it. But even as they had become confident in the final product, unfortunately the same could not be said of the studio. Cameron showed a rough cut to Orion executives in the summer of 1984 and described the screening as disastrous. The studio that had just released the acclaimed historical drama Amadeus did not have quite the same faith in a low-budget sci-fi movie starring a bodybuilder. Orion's chairman reportedly told Barbara Boyle, You made exactly what I was afraid you'd make, an exploitation picture in the Corman style. The distributor was so hesitant they dialed back the marketing plans and cancelled promotional appearances for the cast. They didn't even want to screen the movie for critics, but talent agents who were able to see it and loved it called the studio and pressured them to get behind it, while Heard grappled with the executives over the marketing. The Terminator materialized in theaters on October 26, 1984, and opened in first place against Brian De Palma's Body Double and Universal's horror compilation Terror in the Isles. Critics praised the sci-fi thrills, sly humor, and clever special effects. The movie finished with almost $40 million domestic and nearly $80 million worldwide, although the filmmakers speculated that it would have easily passed $100 million if the studio had properly supported and advertised it. Even after completing the movie and getting it into theaters, the problems were not over. Science fiction author Harlan Ellison filed a lawsuit claiming the movie ripped off Soldier, an episode of The Outer Limits he had written about two futuristic infantrymen thrown back in time. Despite Cameron's objections, Orion just wanted to avoid a lawsuit and settled with the writer for an undisclosed sum and an acknowledgement in the end credits. Cameron later described Ellison as, quote, a parasite who can kiss my ass. While The Terminator had been successful at the box office, particularly in relation to its budget, it didn't even make the top 20 for 1984, landing far behind movies like The Karate Kid, Gremlins, Beverly Hills Cop, and Ghostbusters. It was the expansion of VCRs into homes during the mid-1980s that turned it into one of the most rented movies at the time, and increased its awareness along with demands for a sequel. And well, we all know what happened then. After all its struggles, The Terminator became a sci-fi classic, influencing countless movies and filmmakers to follow, and launching a lucrative franchise of sequels, comics, video games, and toys. Arnold Schwarzenegger became one of the biggest stars in the world, reuniting with James Cameron and Linda Hamilton for the 1991 sequel Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which further advanced computer-generated imagery and redefined the summer blockbuster. Cameron continued to make increasingly ambitious and expensive movies, engineering new filmmaking technologies and shattering box office records. And it all began with the challenges of a passion project born of a fever dream during his fledgling low-budget movie career. Much like his relentless robotic killing machine and the heroine in its sights, James Cameron had altered the future. By now, most movie fans are familiar with the name Pliskin. Call me Snake. Genre master John Carpenter's 1981 sci-fi action thriller Escape from New York is rightfully considered a classic, with an iconic anti-hero that successfully separated star Kurt Russell from his Disney kid persona. And like so many of the entries in John Carpenter's career, it was also not an easy movie to make. With a long and grueling night shoot, and all the challenges of trying to replicate a future New York City on a modest budget. Take a trip to the burned out Big Apple, and find out what the fuck happened to this movie. By 1980, John Carpenter had earned a degree of creative freedom, thanks to some considerable box office success. 1978's Halloween was a slasher smash, eventually banking $70 million on a minuscule budget of $300,000, making it one of the most profitable independent movies of all time. After a brief detour to television with Elvis, featuring Kurt Russell as the king of rock and roll, Carpenter had another horror hit with The Fog, 
which rolled into theaters collecting $21 million on an investment of around $1 million. After demonstrating box office reliability and a skill for transforming low budgets into big thrills and bigger profits, Carpenter was able to make one of his dream projects, Escape from New York, a script he had actually written several years earlier. He was originally inspired by the 1974 Charles Bronson revenge thriller, Death Wish. Not so much the concept of a civilian taking the law into their own hands, but in how the movie depicted New York as a kind of gang-infested jungle, and he wanted to apply that to a science fiction setting. Another influence was the work of sci-fi author Harry Harrison, particularly the book Planet of the Damned, about a young hero sent to save a world bent on self-destruction. Thanks for watching Joe Blow Videos. If you enjoy our shows, please like and subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when new videos go live. Now, back to the show! Carpenter had written Escape from New York after making his feature directing debut on the low-budget sci-fi comedy Dark Star. But at that time, no studio was interested, finding the script too unconventional and violent, and the concept of Manhattan as the country's only prison just too grim. Years later, Carpenter would admit his earlier draft was saturated with the pessimism of the Watergate era. So he enlisted his friend Nick Castle, better known as The Shape himself, Michael Myers, to inject his own skewed sense of humor into the script, like the hilarious ending swap of the president's critical piece recording. Carpenter was also a huge fan of westerns, the repeated line, I thought you were dead, but I heard you were dead, is directly borrowed from the 1971 John Wayne cowboy movie, Big Jake. I thought you were dead, Mr. McCandles. While Escape from New York is technically a sci-fi action movie, Carpenter considers it a western at its core, in that it follows a lone outlaw who defies both authority figures and criminals. Avco Embassy Pictures, who had funded The Fog, would provide the cash for Carpenter to make the movie. Although the initial plan was for Carpenter to make the Philadelphia Experiment, about a time-traveling Navy destroyer. But when script issues brought that experiment to a halt, they turned their focus to rescuing the president from the maximum security penitentiary of New York in futuristic 1997. With around $6 million to work with, Carpenter united with other past collaborators like producers Deborah Hill and Larry Franco, and cinematographer Dean Cundy. Halloween's Dr. Loomis, Donald Pleasance, would play the captured president, President of what? Described as an unholy union of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Adrienne Barbeau, who was Carpenter's wife at the time, would appear as Maggie, the girlfriend of Harry Dean Stanton's valued engineer convict, Brain, a role originally cast with Warren Oates before he became ill. Other minor parts would be filled with Carpenter regulars Tom Atkins, Charles Cyphers, and George Buck Flower. To play the lead role of S.D. Snake Pliskin, decorated World War III veteran turned career criminal, the studio wanted an established screen tough guy like Charles Bronson, Chuck Norris, or Clint Eastwood, all of whom Carpenter considered too old. Another actor the studio approached was Tommy Lee Jones, who had starred in the TV thriller The Eyes of Laura Mars, based on one of Carpenter's other scripts. Jones may have been born grizzled, but he passed on the opportunity to play Pliskin. He'd have to wait until 1986's Black Moon Rising to star in another story from the mind of John Carpenter. The director was dead set on casting Kurt Russell as the cynical ex-Special Forces soldier after forging a relationship with the actor while making Elvis. Although Russell had been pursued by Dino De Laurentiis to star in 1980's Flash Gordon, at that time he was still mainly known for his family-friendly Disney filmography. But eventually the studio relented, and not only did Russell score the role, it was his suggestion to include the trademark eye patch as part of his character. Also joining the production would be Oscar winner Ernest Borgnine as Cabby, and music legend Isaac Hayes would play the primary villain, the infamous Duke of New York. The Duke of New York, eh, hey, number one? The big man, that's who. Lee Van Cleef, the calculating commander of the United States Police Force, was probably best known from Sergio Leone westerns, but he was actually a childhood hero of Carpenter's from the alien invasion movie It Conquered the World. Joe Alves came on board as production designer, however it was not his experience on Jaws or Close Encounters of the Third Kind that most excited Carpenter, but his earlier work animating the monster from the id in the sci-fi classic Forbidden Planet, another of the director's childhood favorites. The production's first major challenge was finding a suitable New York to escape from. While the actual Big Apple was, at the time, basically a crime-ridden hellhole, shooting there was out of the question, as it would be prohibitively expensive and logistically impossible. Alves and Carpenter scoured the country in search of a financially feasible location that could approximate the architecture and skyline of the famous city, eventually settling on St. Louis, Missouri. 
St. Louis had not hosted a major film production in over a decade and welcomed the production with open arms. A severe fire had gutted several blocks of prime urban real estate, making it the perfect location for the movie's decaying metropolis. City officials essentially gave the production free reign to turn off streetlights, set fires, and shut down up to 10 blocks at a time to transform it into the ruins of 1997 Manhattan. For the remains of the president's crashed plane, Alves was visiting an airplane graveyard in Arizona, searching for the movie's Air Force One, when he was told of a decommissioned DC-8 jet that was conveniently for sale back in St. Louis. After purchasing the plane, his crew cut off the sections they needed for the scene and moved them to a vacant downtown lot under cover of night, skipping the whole pesky permit process. St. Louis also happened to have a deserted railway station that could serve as the movie's version of New York's Grand Central, complete with a derelict train. The location was in such rough condition, Carpenter and Alves didn't even have to dress it up to make it seem sufficiently post-apocalyptic. For the movie's fictional 69th Street Bridge, the mind expanse where the climactic pursuit takes place, St. Louis's abandoned old Chain of Rocks Bridge was used after the production purchased it from the government for one dollar. Alves built a fake wall on one side where the president would make his escape. Although it was obviously a bargain, the bridge itself proved dangerous as it was literally falling apart and had a strict weight limit for equipment. Crew members occasionally found themselves stepping right through the crumbling ground. Filming on Escape from New York began during a humid August heat wave, with some nights hitting 100 degrees, so hot the asphalt was melting. Swarms of insects tormented the cast and crew as they filmed near the Mississippi River. The shoot that had been planned for three weeks would stretch past 50 days, exhausting everyone on the production. Barbeau constantly pumped Carpenter full of vitamins and herbal remedies to try and help maintain his energy levels during the rigorous shoot. Carpenter later commented that after going from dusk till dawn for two and a half months, it started to feel like he'd never see the sun again. Kurt Russell also recalled one time he was preparing for a scene alone and came across a group of tough characters, exactly the type you might find in a desolate city neighborhood at 1 a.m. Fortunately, he was in the full Pliskin costume, complete with submachine gun, which was apparently intimidating enough to prevent any hostilities. The star would instead experience hostilities when filming the gladiator clash after he's captured by the Duke. For Snake's gargantuan opponent, a professional wrestler named Ox Baker was hired. Unfortunately, Baker had never worked on a movie before, and both Russell and his longtime stunt double Dick Warlock found themselves legitimately trying to dodge and deflect blows from the towering adversary. After one particularly savage take, Russell asked Baker to dial it down a notch and wrapped him on the groin just to show he meant business, which achieved the desired effect. Russell would also get his revenge with The Killing Blow, a stunt performed with an actual spiked baseball bat, which is about as old school analog as it gets. Baker had a thick pad on the back of his head that Russell would have to accurately strike, which understandably made the large man quite nervous. But luckily, Snake's lack of depth perception was not an issue and he safely nailed the target. As with Russell taking ownership of Pliskin's appearance and gruff Eastwoody personality, Carpenter allowed the cast to get creative with their characters, expanding on them as they saw fit. Isaac Hayes came up with a facial twitch that only occurs when dealing with Snake. It was Donald Pleasance's idea to wear a long blonde wig as part of his humiliation while captive. Actor Frank Doubleday, who plays freaky henchman Romero, added the wild hair and pointy teeth on his own. The backstory of Maggie's long silver fingernails was that she used polished and sharpened tin to turn her hands into lethal weapons. Sadly, she never gets an opportunity to demonstrate this in the movie and instead is mostly seen blasting thugs with Snake's Smith & Wesson. However, Carpenter's flexibility and spirit of collaboration did not extend to the dialogue. In that aspect, the director was a stickler for the written word. Harry Dean Stanton had a habit of improvising, which proved a source of occasional frustration for Carpenter. For the musical sequence, Carpenter and Nick Castle initially wanted the chorus line to perform the Ethel Merman staple, Everything's Coming Up Roses, but couldn't secure the song rights. So they substituted a jaunty, if morbid, tune about coming to the prison of New York. Nick Castle did the choreography for the performers, while Carpenter himself led the band, joined by Dean Cundy and several other crew members. While most of the movie's New York was portrayed by St. Louis, one brief scene was shot on location, and that would also prove to be a challenge. Carpenter needed to capture Liberty Island, the headquarters of the movie's fictional militaristic police force. The city was initially hesitant due to security concerns after a terrorist bombing at the site just a few months prior. There was also some resistance to the idea of New York as a vicious penitentiary. 
but the city eventually gave permission for the helicopters flying past the Statue of Liberty, a sequence carpenter and editor Todd Ramsey cleverly stitched together with the expanded outdoor set filmed at the Sepulveda Dam in Los Angeles. The movie would require impressive visual effects to create a believable world, but in a post-Star Wars Hollywood, finding a talented team with a reasonable rate was a struggle. Not only were the established facilities outrageously expensive, but Carpenter also discovered they had inflated egos and considered themselves celebrities, which led to some unpleasant encounters. To realize his ambitious vision under his creative direction and budgetary limitations, Carpenter ultimately selected famously frugal producer Roger Corman and the economical expertise at his New World Pictures, where a young James Cameron was working. Carpenter was impressed by what they had accomplished with very little money on the sci-fi B-movie Battle Beyond the Stars. The New World visual effects team constructed a convincing scale model of Lower Manhattan and various size miniatures of the Gulfire Glider as it approached and landed on the roof of the World Trade Center. Another fascinating trick they employed was simulating the 3D wireframe computer graphics in the glider by building simple black boxes and lining them with grids using bright tape and then moving a camera through the environment and increasing the contrast to achieve this futuristic result. The challenges for another scene had nothing to do with special effects or coordinating big action, but rather a mundane one. Actor Lee Van Cleef had sustained a painful leg injury and had difficulty walking and had problems concentrating on simultaneously delivering his lines while he and Pliskin navigated the corridors of the police headquarters. Van Cleef actually said it ended up being one of the toughest scenes he had ever filmed. One late addition in the process was the daytime scene of helicopters landing in Central Park, which Carpenter added to break up the movie's overwhelming darkness. It was actually shot in California's San Fernando Valley, with a background matte painting of the skyline done by none other than James Cameron. The constraints of time and budget, along with the necessities of narrative, led to the omission of some ideas, like self-lighting cigarettes that Snake would smoke. Carpenter had also wanted to include more variations of prisoner gangs on the island, like a Native American tribe that was mostly cut from the movie, but make a brief appearance dropping the glider loose from the roof of the World Trade Center. One major change was the elimination of the movie's original 10-minute opening. The sequence, filmed in Atlanta's subway system, depicted the failed bank robbery where Snake is apprehended by the police. But the scene left audiences confused during early screenings, so Carpenter just removed it entirely. He also then realized that Snake's first appearance in custody on Liberty Island was a much cooler introduction to the character. As a way to familiarize viewers with the movie's setting, a new opening animation detailing the history of the alternate future was added. This also provided another opportunity for the involvement of Carpenter's Halloween survivor, Jamie Lee Curtis, who narrates the intro in addition to voicing the announcements in the police HQ. Another scene that required clarification was the death of Maggie, whose fate on the bridge seemed unclear to one particular early audience member who happened to be a teenage J.J. Abrams. So Carpenter and Barbeau added an extra scene of her lying on the ground, drenched with fake blood, which they filmed in the driveway of their home. While Carpenter had scored his previous movies himself, for Escape from New York, he teamed with sound designer Alan Howarth, who had previously worked with editor Doug Ramsey on Star Trek The Motion Picture, while they incorporated Carpenter's distinct synth sound, they also used one of the first drum machines ever made. The pair would collaborate on most of Carpenter's future films. Escape from New York opened in theaters on July 10, 1981. Over that summer, it collected more than $25 million to become John Carpenter's third consecutive box office success. Critics also appreciated the movie's ingenuity, atmosphere, and thrills, and a leading man playing against type. All of the challenges bringing Carpenter's R-rated high concept to screens had paid off. And like so many of Carpenter's films, it would go on to have an enduring legacy, influencing countless other movies, stories, and games like Metal Gear Solid. In fact, its influence on the 2012 Guy Pearce thriller Lockout was so blatant that Carpenter successfully sued Luc Besson and production company Europa Corp for plagiarism and collected half a million dollars. Snake Plissken became one of the most instantly recognizable genre characters in history, and arguably Kurt Russell's most famous role. The director and star would reunite three more times, including another similar experience for Snake with 1996's Escape from L.A., nearly as much a remake as it is a sequel. Some plans for the character's continuing chronicles never came to pass, including a cancelled TV series, video game, and anime sequel, and so far his adventures have only continued in the pages of comics. 
a remake of Escape from New York, has kicked around Hollywood for nearly two decades, passing through the hands of directors like Len Wiseman, Breck Eisner, and Robert Rodriguez, with the Invisible Man remaker Lee Wannell the most recent name involved. Actors who have been attached or rumored for the new Snake over the years include Gerard Butler, Josh Brolin, John Bernthal, and Jeremy Renner. One guy who does not want the job is Kurt's own son, Wyatt Russell. Despite his family connection and resemblance, the actor has made it very clear that he has no intent or interest in inheriting the eye patch. And he does have a good point, after all, there's only one snake. The name is Pliskin. Let us know your thoughts. Leave a comment in the comments. And thanks for watching.